clash. Egypt, China, India, and Greece, the oldest civilizations on Earth, each has a long history full of clashes. Is it inevitable that different cultures should come into conflict? Diversity. A multipolar world is emerging with diversified civilizations. Can we usher in an age of co-prosperity with all religions and cultures working hand in hand for the well-being of mankind? Competition. As ancient civilizations that continue to survive, what competitive edge do they have? And does this give them enough strength to thrive in an increasingly competitive world? Future. Asian civilizations are undergoing rejuvenation and the new international order is taking shape. Will the future give birth to an authentic dialogue of civilizations? Convergence instead of confrontation will take more than political will in navigating the process of globalization based on the more inclusive world order of multilateralism. Today, we are honored to host a brainstorming on the soft power of four great countries that boast of long history and rich, civilized legacies. To get close to the civilizations uh, and tell our own stories, today we have set free a debate platform for four great ancient civilizations. Our discussion will fall into four parts. The clash of civilizations, diversity of civilizations, competition of civilizations, and the future of civilizations. Each nation team consists of a host and an expert commentator. I'm Yang Rui with the CGTN or China Global Television Network. And our guest here on my side is Professor Huang Jing, a university professor and dean of the Institute of International and Regional Studies at the Beijing Language and Culture University. I'm Vanessa Pathanasiu, uh, anchor and diplomatic correspondent with the Greek uh, public uh, television. And next to me is Ambassador Rokanas, an experienced ambassador, the ambassador of uh, Greece in Beijing. I'm Mohammed Abdrahim from Nile TV, and it is my pleasure to introduce you Egypt's expert, and he is uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Abdelmunam Al Mashat, and uh, he is uh, the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Economics and uh, Political Science at Future University uh, Egypt. My name is Vishnu Shom. I'm a senior editor and principal anchor with New Delhi Television, NDTV. We are India's oldest private 24-hour news network. And I've got uh, a wonderful guest uh, with me today, uh, Professor Madhav Nalapath, is professor of geopolitics at Manipal University. Thank you so much for the participation of representatives from ancient civilizations. My first question goes to the Greek team. Now, ancient Greece is known for delivering the first democracy in the world. That has produced a huge impact on the formation of modern political institutions. Question is, Mr. Ambassador, how does this aspect of traditional Greek civilization influence modern Greece? I would say um, from the possible, let's say, systems of government, which according to ancient historian Herodotus are monarchy ruled by one, oligarchy ruled by some, and democracy ruled by all the people, I think democracy is by far the best. The most efficient, both politically, it empowers the people, it gives them voice, and it makes them more productive, more inspired, um, more efficacious. Democracy is not just good because it's, you know, morally and perhaps also theoretically, philosophically good. It gives power and voice to the people and for the people. Exactly, that's my next question. Your Excellency, do you think uh, good functions of democracy today are being held hostage by the rise of populism? I think populism will go away as long as critical economic and other social conditions in Europe uh, abate. Uh, so I do not think that this is a serious problem. We have to take it seriously, of course. We have to deal it seriously. It's not a civilizational problem. War and violence are, on a massive scale, like the two world wars, is a civilizational problem. They are the common enemy of a humankind. Uh, Islamism is one of the major religions that call for harmony and unity. However, Arabs tend to be very disunited. Now, question is, what's wrong with the Arab Spring, which is supposed to have, uh, you know, taken root in democracy? I would like to clarify one point. Of course, 
that uh, there is a big difference between Islam and Muslims, definitely. Islam as a concept uh, calls for mercy, for compromise, uh, peaceful coexistence. Uh, it, that's the history of uh, the early Islamic uh, period. Nowadays, of course, there are the fanatics, terrorists, and so on, which we first uh, um, suffer from uh, before anybody else uh, suffers in Europe or uh, somewhere else. Uh, so what, what we, we have in uh, the Middle East is very different from what we used to have. The Egyptian ancient civilization is based on peaceful coexistence, is based on self-defense, is based on uh, respect of others. It's, it's as, as all of us know, it's the first to introduce the concept of the state to the world. Later on, I mean, uh, centuries later on, they, uh, through the uh, Versailles uh, Convention in 1648, the concept of nation state was established which was established 4,000 years before that convention. I would add also that the, one of the elements of really both uh, ancient uh, civilization and the Islamic traditions is the empowerment of women, contrary to the um, popular kind of literature about Islam. We have the oldest queen uh, Hatshepsut, which ruled, who ruled Egypt for about 20 years. We have Cleopatra during the Roman era, who ruled Egypt and, of course, influenced Europe and European leaders. Following the Doklam crisis that we had uh, last year, uh, quickly we had the summit meeting between President Xi Jinping and uh, Prime Minister Modi in Wuhan. So do you believe that uh, on the one hand, the Americans show great passion for using India as a geopolitical force in the broad context of the Indo-Pacific region. On the other hand, India is clearly aware of being used in this game. Well, you know, uh, I'd, I'd like to point out that the, it, is, it makes logical sense geopolitically for the Pacific and Indian Oceans to be in the same construct for a simple reason that the economies of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean are today so closely intertwined. Previously, after 1945, it was the Atlantic Ocean that is the main focus of economic development. Today, it's the Pacific Ocean and now increasingly the Indian Ocean. For example, in my view, two of the biggest future markets for China would be Africa and India. These are both right there on the Indian Ocean. So I think there's a very strong logic to be made for having the concept of the Pacific and Indian Oceans merge into the Indo-Pacific. So I'd like to say one thing very clearly. India and China comprise 2.7 billion people. India and China, if they are working together with each other, can contribute much more to the world. And if they have problems with each other, the entire world will suffer. In any team, if the team works together, the team wins. If a team fights with each other, a team loses. I've always seen the Indian and Chinese civilizations as one team, and I hope that we are going to work together. Yes, indeed. If the elephant and dragon could join hand in having the tango with a broad smile, then the world will be a lot safer. Today, President Trump ordered the cancellation of an Iran nuclear deal, causing yet another policy debate as to what's going to happen next uh, between civilizations. What do you think uh, should be the response from China? When Sammy Huntington wrote The Clash of Civilization in 1993, actually 92, and then eventually expanded in the book. The basic uh, assumption is that civilizations are going to clash against each other because the values are different. But the problem is that civilizations clash with each other only when one civilization tries to invade the other civilizations and impose its values on others. That's a problem. Democracy should be number one, inclusive. Every one of us is part of it. That's why we rule of people. Number two should be open. And number three should be tolerant. Allow others to exist. In Chinese civilization, the one very important principle in Chinese civilization is that we don't do unto others the sense we don't want others to do upon us. I don't believe 
any old civilization, ancient civilization, believes in the clash of civilization. What happened with the United States and with uh, Samuel Huntington, we know, you know, that he has been commissioned to do this study after the collapse or about the collapse of the Soviet Union to find some enemies in order to push for the industrial uh, military complex in the United States to uh, produce weapons and so on and so forth. We believe in the, uh, as my friend said, multilateralism. Multilateralism means compromises, means you give and take, means win and win situations. It doesn't mean at all uh, domination of one uh, over the other. Tolerance is the key word for establishing peace, establishing coexistence, establish, um, again, stability in the whole universe. Well, you know, I'd like to talk about uh, what we're talking about, this clash of civilizations. Frankly, I don't know why people are taking Huntington so seriously. You can't combine a billion people and say that they're all, they're all alike. I mean, you know, whether it's in China or in India or in Egypt or in Greece, you'll find thousands of different types of people. Now, take the case of Christianity, a very noble faith. The earliest church, if I understand, was in Syria. I have been to that part of Syria, the Patriarch of Antioch, and it's very close to Bethlehem, the birthplace of Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, frankly, the Christians in the United States who talk so much about Christianity, they have no problem in giving guns and money to people who are butchering these uh, Orthodox Christians in Syria. Let's give emphasis to the words of dialogue of civilizations, which come ba back to and down to the uh, realities of democracy and the basic values of the Greek civilization and your respected civilization, which is co cooperation, unity, peace, and not class. In Greece, we don't believe in class of civilization. We believe in cooperation. So let me start with uh, uh, Professor Juan. Uh, there is a debate of how the Greek modern society is related to our history. So is it any, such a debate in your country here in China? I'll start with four symbols. Great Mosque, Sphinx, Python, and Great Wall. And if we know uh, here we're different, that's why we're here to have a dialogue. If you notice all those three symbols, this is the only one, the Great Wall, that doesn't have any spiritual element in it. We all have God in it. So I think at ancient time, we we'll talk about Greek civilization, Egyptian civilization, Indian civilization, we're all about the same. Civilization is a way of life. In the way of life, we have several elements. Number one, how we define ourselves in a given nature, in a given place. Number two, how we as a social animals deal with each other and try, get, try to get along. Number three, we know that. That's why we how to rule and be ruled. We call governance, and governance must have order in the system. And supporting all of that is so-called value system. At the very beginning, all the civilizations started to answer those questions. But then, they go on different ways. All the other three Asian civilizations has been greatly influenced or conquered by a thing called religion. As a result, we go on different ways. In Chinese society, like not bad or good, we never develop a kind of super creator. Chinese civilization is all about human beings' relationship towards each other. Advantage is that we are more pragmatic, but disadvantage is that we do not have a last refugee for moral imperfectness. But on the other hand, the other civilizations developed because religion, and religion becomes a political powerhouse. As a result, it's a great achievement, but also take great sacrifice for all the three other religions in a modern society, in the building of modern nation state to separate church and the state. That's a great achievement. Chinese never went through that because we don't have church. Confucianism is not a special element. Confucianism is all about human beings. As a result, in today's Chinese society, in our political system, we do believe good ideas of democracy, but we see democracy as a way of governance. Let's move to Egypt. Professor Masat, could the values of the four ancient civilizations here provide answers to the majors, today's major problems like wars, economic crisis, migration, etc.? I will start by emphasizing that the, the core of the Egyptian civilization is life, love of life. Even 
the second life. I mean, they, they build the pyramids and all these things we enjoy nowadays in order to prepare for the second life. So Egyptian civilization and Egyptian politics now is fond of life. I think life with all its dimensions, economic, uh, social, uh, political, and so on. Now, in terms of wars, uh, which is, is a f one of the cares of humans, and uh, it's not only expensive militarily but, and financially, but also in terms of human casualties and so on, we don't like to be involved in wars, and everybody else should not be. In fact, we understand that the essence of wars is the clash of interests and the conflict over interests. Should we have means to uh, converge these interests together? Yes, there are. There are lots of ways. Again, negotiations, compromises, and so on and so forth. One of the good things about my, 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 the emphasis on uh, bargaining and compromise that we use during the uh, dark days of the Arab-Israeli conflict to go through track to diplomacy. I was part of that. In fact, we held uh, lots of meetings in Greece. It's backdoor diplomacy in order to get the, f uh, the feed back from everybody and then go to our government and say, guys, we can, these are the, uh, the room for compromise and win-win uh, and situations. So one thing about war, it should be defensive. It should, of course, we shouldn't have wars, but should be defensive, uh, legitimate war. Um, once you are attacked, you have to defend yourself. Of course, this is one of the uh, functions of any political system to defend its people and so on. Now, in terms of uh, uh, technology and development, um, I would, uh, in, in your presence, I would appreciate what the BRICS is doing. I think BRICS is an attempt. We are not part of the BRICS. I hope we will be one day part. Of, I hope Greece also might be part of that. But the idea of BRICS is to go from the Cold War mentality, which has been established in 1945 uh, until the collapse of the Soviet Union, to something else, a new era um, out of Cold War. We still live in the Cold War mentality and Cold War era, notwithstanding Trump's role and so on. With, that's a kind of mentality we are suffering from. I think with the BRICS, hopefully it would expand more, we could be transformed into something new. Professor Nalabat, let's say in conflicts and negotiations, uh, uh, countries which reach history have a disadvantage or an advantage? Well, I'd like to say that, you know, culture and civilization actually not conflict but cooperation if you understand culture and understand civilization correctly. As our Egyptian uh, friend said, Islam stresses compassion, mercy, beneficence. So, you know, the fact is, True spirituality, true civilization, true culture will bind each other in the 21st century when information flow is so, is so wide. In India, for example, we had the Vedic period, the ancient period, which was coterminous with Greece. In fact, several of the gods and goddesses of the Hindu pantheon are very similar to the gods and goddesses of the Greek pantheon. Very, very similar. You, we have the Mughal period. And the Taj Mahal is a very proud representation of the Mughal period. We had the British period. And let me say, as an Indian, all of us in India, whatever the religion we belong to, our cultural DNA has the Western, has the Mughal, and the Vedic. All three strands are there in our DNA. We cannot say we are only one of the strands. All three exist together. I think that is the greatness of India. Uh, what I wanted to say is that starting from, starting from democracy again, where I began, democracy originally, why was it created in ancient Athens? It was created to solve practical problems. It's not an ideology, democracy. It was a practical system to solve practical problems between free people. There's no other way to be free and to respect each other except for the democratic system. So. It was to reconcile the different freedoms within a city, the freedoms of the different individuals, and also to reconcile the clashes between the haves and the have-nots, those who had property and those who didn't, the poor and, and the rich. So democracy has survived because it's an efficient system, also economically. The Nobel Prize winner, Amartya Shen, the, the, has written a magnificent book praising 
no, development as freedom back in the 90s, praising, yeah. praising uh, the, good, the good side of democracy for economics. It's an economically perfect system uh, uh, you know, and liberty. The, uh, so uh, yeah. let me finish. So democracy was not ideological. It was a very practical system and a very efficient one at that. Second, uh, what, what I wanted to say is that also civilization. Yes, please, you know, please. I, I just want to say, Ambassador, that I'm not an expert on Greek history, but I've heard of Athens, I've heard of Sparta, and I'm told Sparta was quite successful in several respects, uh, including over it, Athens. I have learned of the Roman period of the Caesars. I'm not sure you'll agree that the period of rule of the Caesars was a democratic period, but Rome expanded very high I mean, during that period. So frankly, I'd like to say, this idea that there is a cure-all, that democracy is a cure-all, or some other system is a cure-all, I think that's a little bit of a simplistic concept. And I think we can't argue that any one system is best for everybody. Does one size fit all? Does one size fit no, all? No, that's no. fundamentally the issue. I, I, did, not, I did not say that, mm -hmm. first of all. I, 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 I told you at the beginning that there are many types diversity. of democracy. Universality as opposed to diversity, that's a core issue that we have to face and need to find a solution collectively. Can I say something about civilization before? Uh, that the civilizations are, by definition, a product of dialogue. Dialogue has created our civilization, a dialogue with neighboring, uh, you know, uh, neighboring peoples. Dialogue creates civilization, and civilizations fundamentally are not inimical, and they're not estranged from each other. Civilizations contain the element of dialogue with the other civilizations. And I contend that today, the most important thing is to think about a global civilization, a global culture, something that would be produced not by friction and by fission, to use physics, not fission, not conflict, but fusion and integration. This is where we're heading. This is where our kids are heading. So the, let's think about a global culture, a global civilization. This is what is being created now. Ecological civilization is a part of a global culture, already here, with us, with our kids. Thank you so much. Let's move from the Greek side to the Egyptian side to continue our meaningful dialogue about civilizations. The most important thing is to think about a global civilization, a global culture. We should to keep our common ground, to flourish upon our common ground on the major issues while reserving our differences on the minor issues. We have to go beyond the existing world order. The world is one family. The point about a family is you may be different, you may dislike each other, you may argue with each other, but you cannot escape the fact that we are all from the same family. Because we are in a dialogue of civilizations and religion by nature is one of the definitions of a civilization, I'm telling you something. Muslims have a problem that they are being seen and perceived by many people around the world as so-called uh, fanatics uh, or, or, or so on. Until the world realizes, uh, but I understand that because of September the 11th and, 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 and recent events, but this is a flashpoint in history, isn't it? History is thousands of years that were past and thousands of years that are coming. So it's at this moment in history, that's the perception, and maybe some people, maybe some people have uh, an excuse to have this perception. But in other, I think in other moments in history, you, you must have seen the, uh, 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 you know, the, the people I mentioned. Many Muslims around the world feel that they are being treated with a double standard. A couple of things I really would like to, to comment on. One is that the, it's very unfortunate that the minority of fanatics are more organized and also more financed by whoever uh, is behind them. And that's why we, as the, you know, Muslim liberals or true Muslims, or you call it whatever you call, or those who believe in human values more than uh, in, uh, uh, exclusive values are uh, badly organized. Uh, they don't have the financial means to confront those fanatic groups. The fanatic groups 
are well based again in Europe, actually more than in the Middle East. They get their finance from whatever. Uh, Isn't it the US the who put them, Dr. Mashot, to, to, to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan and then when they yeah. went for oil in Iraq? We have to ask questions about who established ISIL and ISIS in Syria and Iraq. I mean, not definitely uh, the, the moderate Arabs or moderate Muslims. They are the fanatics and the West who really stabbed them, including Turkey. They created a uh, um, um, uh, safe haven for uh, immigrants from uh, recruit, recruited guys from Europe and everywhere, and even from the Arab states. But I think in order to move forward, what we really need in terms of our presence here is to create harmony among humans and get the positive values from each of us into the new world. We have to go beyond the existing world order. I th and I am sure from my reading of history that we are moving forward. However, there is one impediment in that process, which is the emergence of the rightist movements, which are as fanatics as the yes. Muslim yeah. uh, Brotherhood and the Bahabis and so on, with different forms. Not this, by the way, the Wahhabis and the Muslim Brotherhood are not really committed Muslims. They are utilizing the religion in politics. So the rightist movement in Europe or somewhere else are, and, and the fanatics in, in our side also are the impediment to, for us to move forward from the uh, international order nowadays into the new harmonious kind of order. That I think we have to work on that more than anything else. Yeah, uh, uh, I think, yeah, I agree. Let's start with Confucianism. Confucianism believes that, always proclaim that, when you suffer, you have to first look inward. Yeah. What, I, what did I do wrong to deserve all the sufferings? I'll give you an example. Ever since 1840, China has been invaded, humiliated, injustice, a lot of them, ever since. And Chinese people harbor a deep, deep resentment against all those injustices. But now in China, well, our scholars, our people, also look inward and say, why 1840 could have happened to us? Because we did not try enough. We stay satisfied with a kind of civilization we like. We build a great wall to encircle ourselves, so we become backward. And we cut off the maritime we commerce maritime in the Ming times. dynasty. So we did a lot of bad things. That's why we, we realized if you do not move forward, you deserve to be hit. And I do not mean that all happened to all the Muslim brotherhood is right. It's absolute injustice. I understand when my people are, kill, are killing by, not by thousands, but millions every year, of course, I, I really, really miserable, and I want to do something to take this emotion out. But if I remember correctly, let me finish that. It's exactly what Quran said, that we should treasure, we should follow by our knowledge and rationality. Also in Quran said, yes. the most evil thing is hatred. If you are guided by hatred, then you are going to hell. That's why I say that, why we have this kind of thing called terrorism, Two things. Number one, three, I'm sorry. This most actions taken by some terrorists is guided by hatred, by emotions, not by rationality, not by knowledge. Number one. Number two, all of them are taken under the name of God. That's the worst situation. I do this because I want to serve my God. When you ever do that, you committed a crime already, not against other people, but against your own God, your own people. Let me finish. Most Number of three. them are being financed. No, no, no. So if you're doing no, it no. for God, let, you're let, not going to be financed. Let me finish. Number three, you began to kill innocent people. No matter what the other side did to you, I don't think anyone has a legitimacy, has a right to kill the innocent people just because he or she happened to stand on the other side. Absolutely. Have you said that? Professor, have you said that? Let, let, have you said that? A, a, a terrorist let, let, let people just is like a terrorist yeah, have entity you said that? Have you said that, that kills people. I absolutely yeah. agree with you. Yeah. Hypocrisy, double standard is yeah. bad. Yeah. It's worse in human beings. Yeah. I do what I like, but when you do it, you have to do according to my standard. That's really, really bad. Right. But I also, that is why we have to believe that rationality will eventually prevail. We have to 
we have to believe, like you just said, Egyptians love life. Love life means what? Means if I kill one life, I kill myself already. We, we really hope so. We really hope that no, uh, let's say, that's why we have to stand together. Stand together. The problem is to the make people the understand hypocrisy, double standards is the worst enemy we are facing now, not just by your civilization, but also by my civilization. Right. Yes, I because, agree with you. Because the fanatics are, are but there But against the Confucianism, to stop the crime, I have to do it started from myself. I think in Quran also said that. I wanted to ask uh, uh, His Excellency, the uh, ambassador of Greece uh, to Beijing, uh, now defining the characteristics of uh, um, civilizations, scholars have gone along the lines of many uh, criterions, like uh, advanced cities, organized central government, religion, jobs, social classes, writing, art, architecture, and so on. In your view, what are the most important and most significant traits of a civilization? Look, uh, historically and scientifically, these are all things, you know, we started, of course, with uh, technology, you know, the myth of Prometheus handing off the technology and fire to the human race. Of course, uh, the creation of agriculture. China is a testimony of that. Mesopotamia, Egypt, creation of agriculture has been absolutely instrumental in, in building great civilizations. I would say language and art, artistic and linguistic expression that actually sprang out of nothingness between 50 and 100,000 years ago. This was a, mi a miracle, mainly due probably to the workings of our brain and some mutations that happened. All these have been extremely, extremely important. There's a book that talks about by, by a Robert Kelly, an anthropologist, that talks about the fifth beginning. 500 years ago, we started a new type of era, around 1500s, with modern technology, with, uh, based on scientific progress, based on printing, and some great advantages that have been made by humanity. I think this, you cannot and you can never pick just one factor that is responsible for humanity's civilization. Civilization is a multifaceted and multi, let's say, dimensional phenomenon. It's by origin that, so you cannot pick one. All have been instrumental in the creation and in the historical development up till now. The important thing to remember is that we are in a new era now. Chinese leadership says that too. We are in a new era. And we have to pinpoint which are the basic things that we are doing now. I would put a couple of two, one or two things on the table for discussion. Our new era is beyond, let's say, the last industrial age, which was based on informatics and electronics and all that. The new era is digitalized. It's going to be a digital era. It's going to be a virtual era. It's going to be an era of artificial intelligence, of cloud computing, of big data. It's going to be of high tech, of five star quality science that's going to bring us to what? Quantum computing, to incredible things. We are already in that. We are looking for fusion that would presumably save. Uh, nuclear free fusion, thermonuclear reactions that would save, could save the energy problem of humanity. So, look, we have been doing what we have been doing now is actually pathology. We have been examining the pathological symptoms, fanaticism, exclusivism, nationalism, all the isms are pathological phenomena. Let's look at the cures now. We have diagnosed, but this discussion would be more productive if we look at the cures. I contend that civilization is a multidimensional phenomenon, open phenomenon. It's open to the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you so much. Let's move on to the Indian side to conclude our discussion about the future of civilizations. Ray, thank you very much. I'm going to keep this short to exactly 10 minutes. Uh, this is a segment where we look actually at our futures. This is a segment where we try and understand where this discussion among civilizations is actually going. There are so many areas of, of interest and so many areas which are disparate, but ultimately, do we have it 
within ourselves in an international economic order, in an international political order, uh, where there remain so many areas of difference. I'm going to come first across to either one of you. Isn't China, in a sense, trying to do what the United States has done so far? China is an emerging in terms superpower. Of what? In terms of what? In terms of spreading its influence. Now, the question is, how is influence spread? The United States, you could argue, has done it directly through, through the influence packs. of unilateralism or the influence of so a more inclusive world, such as the Belt and Road so, Initiative. So, so let That's me a different my, forms of influence. Right. So my question is, how would you respond to those who say that China's vision of expansion is unilateralism if you look at the, the Belt and Road Initiative, for example? That's a very legitimate question, very good question. And to understand what Belt and Road Initiative is, we have to say what it is not first. Number one, Belt and Road Initiative is now China's massive foreign aid program. Chinese, no, we are countries, still developing country. We are not rich enough to serve money, number one. Number two, it is not and should not be China's Marshall Plan. We all know what Marshall Plan is. That is, United States will generously provide aid to Western European countries to strengthen American's dominance in Western Europe. And post-war reconstruction. Also, yes, so China should not take Belt and Road Initiative as China's Marshall Plan. That's deadly wrong. Last but not the least, Belt and Road Initiative is not a state-led or state-guided strategy. No, it's just economic development initiatives. Then what Belt and Road Initiative is, number one, it is an inclusive, open, and trying to create a win-win situation scheme for economic development. China cannot do Belt and Road without cooperation of countries around China, especially India. You just said a lot of part, if without India's cooperation or without India's at least understanding, Belt and Road neither can be successful because India is right in the middle of it. So it's, it's a cooperative, inclusive. Number two, because of that, Belt and Road is driven by what? By market forces, by economy which means we have to make money together. Number three, because of that, Belt and Road need government's policy to support it to, as a guidance. Without government support, Belt and Road will not ever be successful. Let me finish. Last but not the least, Belt and Road should focus on the project that is doable, that is profitable. Last but not the least, Belt and Road should be pushed by the enterprises by the business, not by the government. And all of this must be guided by rule of law, the honor of contract. That's what Belt Road should be. But let's be very frank. Even in China, there are huge debate and even division about what Belt Road sh is and what should so do. So it's something that's, that's clearly normal. open, open but to trust discussion. Me, as just trust me, if you read President Xi Jinping's all the speeches, all the government official documents, Belt Road at least in government official explanations, it is as what it is. It's okay. an economic development initiative. No more, no less. Okay. Whether it is so or not, please wait and okay, see. I need, I'm running out of time. I have only less than five minutes now. The second yeah. question, which I actually again wanted to ask either of you, is the entire issue of sovereignty. When we are talking about Belt and Road, and India's perspective in this is that as, as far as economic growth, trade, or infrastructure is concerned, we welcome any initiative. But when there is an issue of sovereignty, how would you respond to those who say that China has double standards? First, let me say sovereignty is a modern product. In the Mongol Empire, Qing Dynasty, or Han Dynasty, or Egyptian, or Greeks, we don't have such an issue called sovereignty. Sovereignty is a product of colonialization, imperialism, and modern nation state building. Period. That is why, but the problem why both India and China and other countries take sovereignty so, so sensitive, because we learn sovereignty through suffering. India did not sovereignty, did not even know there's an Indian without Raj, British Raj. China don't know this cause and cause sovereignty without 1840. We learned from a very negative way. We paid a lot for it. That's why it's so sen sensitive, number one. Number two, because of that, as India and China both are emerging nation a developing country, we're in a learning process. How to deal with this sensitive issue, sovereignty, we both paid bloody, bloody price for it, number two. Number three, exactly because of that, we should emphasize what we should now do when we come to sovereignty issue before we know what we should do. What we should now do, for example, India and China, when sovereignty issue, we should never use force. Yes. 
We should never join the third party against each other. We should never conspire with any international organizations to against others for my sovereignty issue. This is what we should not do. I then what we completely. should do, then first that what we should do is that keep our relationship open. When we have sovereignty issue, then keep our relationship closed. We try to solve it between us. Number, two. Number three, uh, of course, as it's always, China's uh, uh, insistence. Also, Indian has China's land greedy with Indian, with Indian's non-alignment approach. That's why China trying to learn. That is, we should always keep a very firm stance, a sovereign sovereignty issue, either it's the South China Sea or China-Indian border or, or Kashmir so on and so forth, through dialogue here, dialogue, peaceful dialogue. Well, so it is through making a compromise rather than making a war. Let us hope that that process of, uh, of compromise and dialogue is also backed by standards which we all believe in. For example, standards against terrorism, standards, issues which concern sovereignty of both nations. Be that as it may, I'd like to hand back to you with one uh, important development, and I'm sure you'd agree with me. India and China, as two great civilizations, now have enormous hope and potential post the strong leadership of both uh, of India and China in the Wuhan summit, where it's been decided to de-escalate tensions. And that process of de-escalation is actually taking place on the ground in areas where it matters. And I think the fact that we've not fired a bullet at each other in anger is the spirit that really needs to extend to taking forward the unimaginable potential which exists between our no, countries. Uh, I, I just want to add to that point. We are talking about culture. We are talking about civilizations. We are talking about radical Islam and the radical right. The foundation for all that is economic inequality and, uh, frankly, poverty. You have large sections of the population today in the United States or in Europe or in other parts of the world who are relatively getting less and less compared to the higher levels. And therefore, they're turning to the radical right. You know, we are seeing it everywhere. So the main point about two countries coming together is will these countries promote economic growth for the mass of people? If they do that, it's a healthy interaction. If they stop economic growth for the mass of people, it's an unhealthy interaction. You cannot have civilization and culture unless you have a steady platform of growth. Let's not forget, in the past, coming to my country, you know, thousands of years ago, we had royal palaces. And many of the dances and traditions of modern India have their origin to the money given by the royal palaces to various artists. Okay, back to you as we're running out of time. Yeah. I think I've been following this very dynamic discussion for well over one hour, and one of the questions that impressed me most was the one raised by our Egyptian counterpart on the most important trade in civilization. And the Greek ambassador, His Excellency, put his finger on a very important aspect of civilization. That's the use of technology. With that, I hope we can conclude this brainstorming on the soft power of four ancient civilizations. I thank you very much for your insightful contributions to the success of this discussion. Great civilizations enlighten the world. Shared values. The best place of democracy and the Olympic Games. Egypt spearheaded the shaping up of civilizations. The Humayun storm in Delhi, a world heritage spot, a marvel of Mughal architecture. The Great War behind me was historically meant to block foreign invasion. In our program in Beijing, I'll be giving you the Indian standpoint. Let's find out the real values of our civilizations walking through the history. Let's go down to China and meet up with another great civilization along with the civilizations of Egypt, India and Greece. That's our dialogue with civilizations. Now time for questions from the audience. My name is uh, Dr. David Bartosz. I'm a cultural philosopher from Germany. Professor Rang, uh, Huang uh, reminding us of Confucius we should not do to others what we do not want them to do to us, so the golden rule. And is there some ancient Egyptian wisdom, maybe from the pharaonic times, a very ancient wisdom that we can learn from? In fact, the, the major issue with the Egyptian civilization, which is still with us until this moment, is the uh, sustainable flow 
of the Nile water, which is, as you, all of you might know, Egypt is the gift of the Nile. Now, as long as the, um, the water is sustained and the flow is going on, it means for us that life is going on. In other words, we got the coexistent values, the peace uh, uh, and stability from the stability of the flow of the Nile water. You know that are eight countries, who are the, the riparian countries, uh, eight of them, you know, Ethiopia and others, um, and the flow of the, the sustainable flow of water, which means the continuous living of the Egyptians, is the core of the value of peace and peaceful coexistence and tolerance in the Egyptian history until this moment. Can I add a few words on that? I think in Confucianism or Chinese civilization at large, there is a very important principle. We realize we are different, and we recognize that difference, and we also recognize we never become like each other. That's difference. However, we should never ever let our differences overwhelm our common ground. That's Da Tong common ground on the major issues. What is common ground? Just like my Egyptian colleague said, the love for life, to live, to survive, to continue to improve our life together. That's why we should to keep our common ground, to flourish upon our common ground on the major issues while reserving our differences on the minor issues. Because no matter how different we are, we are still all human beings. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Marina. I'm a graduate student in Communication University of China. And my question would be probably addressed to all of the dear guests. And that is, how do you see the changes in your country in the nearest 30, 20 years in terms of the keeping traditions, uh, cultural traditions, I mean, versus uh, adapting to the ideals of modern world? And specifically, I'm interested in the attitudes to the women's rights and uh, the women's roles in the society. Actually, I believe in the last century, one of the greatest social movements has been the so-called emancipation. It's the revolution of women. It's not the emancipation of women. But civilization and the new developments present us with an issue. That is the balance between family and personal and work. We have to balance the psychological and the social with, you know, with the, let's say, the economic uh, realm and the economic environment, which is very demanding, that we now live in. And this is one of the defining questions that we're going to be facing in the globalized planet. This is one of the rem remnants of the old order that have to be set, they have, have to be put again on the table to solve. Next question from our Indian friend. I'm uh, Atul Aneja from the Hindu newspaper. My question is to the Greek ambassador. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, what do you think should be the core Greek philosophical derivative, let me put it that way, which would help in warding off the clash of civilizations? Dialogue is not just you know, coexistence, and it's not just tolerance. It's active, not just communication, but interaction and vital interaction between two rational human existences, human beings. If it's not rational and if it's not vital, it's not dialogue. The second is the notion of omonia. Omonia means concord. In, in ancient Latin, it was concordia. It means this. We are all different. It's very Confucian, in a sense. We are all different and we recognize that we are different. But there are some problems that we have to face together. We have to fight a flood. I might disagree with you on many, many issues and on many personal things, fiercely enough. But we have to fight the flood and we have to fight together against the river. Otherwise, we're going to be drowned. It's concord. You don't have to, it doesn't mean that we agree or we have the same opinion. It means we stand together on some very vital issues. The third, is the notion of ecumeni, ecumeni. It means universal. So ecumenical spirit is the answer. We are all inhabiting the same planet. Last but not least, we have done something very practical about it. We have initiated together with China the so-called Ancient Civilizations Forum. 
We created this international group to promote cultures and civilizations and to actually make them relevant in today's politics and economics. So we are doing something practical about it. And the answer to, let's say, the problems of our civilizations is that we have to go deeper and start a philosophical discussion between all thinking human beings about who we are and what respect we owe to each other. Because that's the magical word. It's about respect. And respect is because we all are equal in dignity. So I finish here. <laughs> Professor Nalapal. I just want to say I'm delighted that you, know, you have the Taj Mahal here. It's a monument built out of love, the human emotion of love, the love of a king for his uh, departed spouse, uh, Mumtaz Mahal. And I think that it's very important what drives a particular action, what drives a particular policy. Is it hate? Is it love? And the, uh, the, the Taj Mahal backdrop, as an Indian, I'm very happy that that's the backdrop. Now take, for example, my name. My name is my mother's family name. It's not my father's family name. And I'm sorry to say 99% of human beings in India, including women, adopt the father's family name. I don't see why more can't be like me and adopt my mother's family name. I want to end, end by saying the a foundational concept in India, which is common to so many civilizations, is Vasudeva Kutumbakam. The world is one family. The point about a family is you may be different, you may dislike each other, you may argue with each other, but you cannot escape the fact that we are all from the same family. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. With that, we come to the end of this enlightening brainstorming on the soft power of four ancient civilizations. Well, when we talk about the importance of dialogue in putting civilizations together, I emphasized one message, and I conveyed this loud and clear, civilizations also thrive on crisis. Very enlightening brainstorming on the soft power of four great ancient civilizations. Uh, now, may I have the honor to invite each of the three national teams to voice their concerns to, and to sum up what we have discussed. What we do here today is a platform of working together, talking together, making dialogue all together. This is the way, the dialogue, and taking advantage of civilization, which is uh, the substance of civilization and the, 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 the uh, values of all of the uh, civilizations that uh, are very important for the future. We have to play like one, and if we play like one, and we are very close, by the way, anyway. I mean, the differences are minimal. So if we play like one, is, is the smartest way forward? It's the only way forward, dialogue. Multilateralism, imbibing each other's cultures, values, and recognizing that there needs to be space and difference in, a, in, 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 in one's approach, I think, is the way to go. Thank you, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, including the audience behind us, uh, for your patience, your time, your wonderful views that ensure the success of this enlightening brainstorming. See you next time. Bye-bye.